Are you ready to get in the word? Baruch Hashem. Parashat, what? By a chef. You get around all these Torah portions, by Yishlach, by Yishech, by Era. I mean, it just goes on and on. They went, they, they, they stayed, they sat. They <laughs> it's an interesting, huh? Well, today's no different. Today's no different. So this one starts in chapter 37, verse 1 through chapter 40, verse 23. Uh, you heard the reading from the Haftarah from the book of Amos and Matthew. Matthew. Uh, but I just want to just briefly cover how many enjoyed last week's bat mitzvah? Uh, she's, she's somewhere with the youth, obviously. Enjoy Melody's reading and uh, all the, uh, basically, the message that she gave you, right? You remember the message she gave you? Okay, if you didn't remember, we're going to review it anyway. <laughs> but we definitely want our children as they move into uh, teenage years and into adulthood we want to be able to have them go through that progression and that progression is taking on more and more of God's word into their life and putting them into action so this is just an outline from uh, this Torah portion which begins with uh, dreams uh, Joseph seeks his uh, brethren the plot against Joseph uh, Yaakov deceiving, you know, deceived by his uh, sons, Judah and Tamar, God blessing Yosef in Egypt, Yosef wrongly accused, in prison, and later on, obviously, more dreams. So this is all dreams within dreams, bookends of dreams. And really, in these last few Torah portions, we've had a lot of that. We have a lot of dreams, a lot of these interactions between heaven and earth. And this is no exception here. So last week, just a little bit of review, Melody talked to us about what comes around goes around. You remember that? She had a little merry-go-round. That was cute. <laughs> and she said, sowing and reaping, which is obviously something you find in the scriptures, and when she spoke about the context about Yaakov going what he was going through, and we all have to take very present that anything what we do, we are always in the mode of sowing, okay? Our intent is to sow, sow the word of God into people's lives. Then we had the opportunity to go through a reconciliation between Yaakov and Esau, Then we have the interaction between Yaakov and the Malach, and there are several interpretations of such. Uh, some of the sages talked about that what he was encountered was his Yetzer Hara, or his evil inclination, or even that he was basically encountering Esau, because there was a struggle, right? And then we get further uh, into that, and we see also that Malach, in this particular messenger, was almost like, he was also encountering this being which he asked for a blessing. In this case, not any malach. So you have all these levels of interpretation of what Yaakov went through, and ultimately he got blessed, marked, and his name changed to, to Israel. We had the events in Shechem. We had the death of Rachel and Deborah and the death of Yitzhak. And it ends with the genealogy of Esau. And that's where we're going to begin today. We are moving into the new stage of Yaakov's life. We can't go very far, even past the first pasuk or the first uh, verse here, until first we examine what happened here to the latter end of the last uh, Torah portion. We talked about this Esau genealogy, this Toledot. Okay? Esau basically was interacted with his brother, came reconcile as the Torah said he ran toward his brother and we remember that interaction that took place 
but the Torah took the time to enumerate the genealogy before we move forward into this new chapter after he encounter his brothers. And the sages say that this interaction between brothers here in that last Torah portion by Ishlach is probably one of the biggest mistakes Yaakov ever made. An opportunity that Yaakov had as they see it. Do you ever wonder why? Well, let's read a little bit further, and then this will become more clear. So let's read from the last Torah portion, if you read in chapter 36, verse 8. And it reads something like this. And Esau dwelt in the mountains land of Seir. Seir. Esau, or Esau, is Edom. What is the word for this particular verse where it says dwelt? What is the name of this Torah portion? By a chef. He dwelt. Same word. Same word. But now we're talking about last Torah portion with Esau, okay? Then he goes on there, chapter 36, verse 40 to 43. And it goes like this. And these are the names of the chiefs that came with Esau, according to their families, after their places, and by their names. And it goes to enumerate eight chiefs. And these are the eight chiefs or kings of Edom, according to their habitations in the land and possession. And then it goes on to repeat, this is Esau, the father of the Edomites. Rashi states in his commentary of these passages that the reason all these eight chiefs or kings of Edom are mentioned here, they're all outside of Canaan, right? Edom is outside of Canaan. All these are nullified by those kings from the land of Canaan that come from Yaakov. So now you're thinking about, hold it, Esau and Yaakov. You came... How long have they been struggling? Since they were in their mother's womb. And he said there will be how many? There will be two peoples. So you're talking about now kingdoms. Follow me? Okay, so these kings are being, they're being established. You, you just heard about the Edomite kings. And the sages tease that Yaakov, from Yaakov's side, there were also eight kings. You want to know who they are? Shaul, you remember? Ishbosheth, which is basically his fourth son. David Hamelech, Shlomo, Rahavam, Avia, Asa, and Jehoshaphat. Eight kings. Of who? Of Israel. It was after this time, it says in 2 Kings 8:20, that and then Edom revolted. Because otherwise, the kings of Canaan were over Edom. Edom was no longer had their own kings. And remember is, who's going to serve who? The older will serve. And there you see. Again, that's an illusion. And confirming it. It says, and Edom revolted at that time, after the times of Jehoshaphat. In Second Kings, uh, in First Kings twenty two forty seven, and in Second Kings eight twenty, it says, "In appointing kings over themselves." And in uh, verse forty seven, it says, "There was then no king on Edom, only a deputy to the king." So, after these eight kings that we're talking about here, and we see the two kingdoms, Esav, Edom. Yaakov, Canaan. Eh? They revolted. The Edomites revolted. So now Canaan has no control over these Edomites. So I'm just giving you kingdom concepts here. So now let's go back and look at chapter 37, verse 1. And it says, By Yaakov, be. Edits, and then this wording 
red here has the root word from ger, which means sojourning. Okay? Sojourning with his father, Be'eretz Canaan. So, two things you see here. The same word I just used for Esau. Dwelling, but in a totally different place. Edom. And now, it's taking Yaakov, stopping in the land. Not just any land. Canaan. Canaan. This is significant. This is the land of the promise. It was promised to his avicha, Abraham Avino. But also, the land which his dad resided. Who was his dad? Yitzhak. Not a trick question. As a what? Ger, which is the root word of the we see there. He sojourned there in this land. The Rambam says that one of the distinguishes qualities about Yaakov and about Yitzhak is that they prefer to dwell in Canaan rather than outside of Canaan. So let's look first at the first words in that you see here. Now Jacob was settled in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. What is this word by a chef? What is this word by a chef? What's well, funny that you ask? You know, the root word is yashab, from the Hebrew word yashab. And it has several meanings, including dwelling, sitting, remaining. I don't know what it says on your Bible. They're saying living in some Bibles it says also. Many meanings. But there's an interesting meaning also here that alludes to kingdom. It also means to sit in throne. And that's very interesting because it denotes kingdom. It denotes authority. Look here at this example in 2 Samuel. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from thence the ark of Hashem, where upon it's called his name, even the name of the Lord of hosts. That what? Guess what word it is? Here it is in Hebrew. Shem Adonai Sevaot Yashaf. There's the root of the word. Same root of word of the one up there. You see it in blue? So now we have that as an example. There's an additional example. You can find it in Psalms 29.10. It says, the Lord sits enthroned, which is the same word, over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. Do you see the application here for king, kingdom? Okay. Now let's see if we put it back into the passage. At the top. Now Jacob was enthroned in the land where his father sojourned. The land of Canaan. Interesting. We had just finished covering Esau and his descendants. And now Yaakov is giving preeminence right here. And in the next couple of verses, the word speaks about his generations. Where? In Canaan. What is Canaan? Obviously, what became the Holy Land of Israel. And remember back in Genesis chapter 25, verse 23, Hashem spoke to Rivka and told that these two nations that were in her womb and two peoples and the older will serve the younger one as we just mentioned. And this strive had been going on between the twins and the opportunity to really make tikkun and reconciliation, restoration, reparation was really passed back in the last Torah portion. After Isa ran after his brother, Yaakov was afraid. They met, exchanged pleasantries, but did not leave together. The Torah says that Yaakov went towards Sukkot and Esau 
back to Seir. And despite Yaakov just prevailing against the Malach, the angel, being renamed Israel, seeing the face of God and naming the place Peniel, he failed to bridge the gap with his brother Esau. That's what the sages teach. Now, let's flip the coin. And let's look at this coin on the other side. Because as many are on that side, there are many on this side. Hassal also teaches and points out that the term Yeshav, in this case by a chef, for Yaakov is a negative connotation. Why is that? Because sitting also denotes passiveness. Sitting can be an attitude. Just like it had in the Torah portion, Yaakov was passive in relationship to making tikkun. You know, sometimes in life we become passive. We want everything to come our way. We're not unwilling to go out and do it. This is the reference that you're using here in this particular sitting down. We sit down and we don't take action. And the opportunities pass us by. So this is, relates to the very first question that I said that, uh, that you will know why the sages looked at it as one of his biggest mistakes. He wasted, supposedly, the opportunity. Instead of moving along, meeting him, he delayed, used others to deflect his approaching brother. Esau ran and offered some of his own people to Yaakov. Offered to go before him and begged him to go with him. Despite that, Yaakov did not accept the invitation and left for Sukkot. The Remis, he failed to bring himself under where he went. Where did he go? Sukkot. Sukkot, Sukkah. He failed to bring his brother under the tent. Many times we don't realize how these opportunities come into our life and we fail to bring our brothers under the tent because of fear, because we run, because we don't necessarily see it as an opportunity. But one of the things that we always tell you here that he should have learned from his grandfather, Abraham Avino, is the principle of Hadnasar Rufin of hospitality. His grandfather immediately saw the Malachim and brought him in under the tent. And the true attempt for tikkun and restoration could have possibly taken place. So, my advice, beloved, is let's not be like Yaakov in this particular light that we're discussing. Let's do everything in our power to reach and give our brother an opportunity for tikkun. If your brother rejects us or rejects you, or if he tries to hurt you, hurt us, we know we made every attempt to restore that relationship for the sake of the kingdom. The separation and the lack of tikkun between Yaakov and Esau affects us till this day. We, from the nations outside of Canaan, need to go back to Israel. Edom needs to go back to Israel. Israel needs to receive the brother, forgive and bring him under their tent or tabernacle with them. Roman Christianity needs to come back to Israel, to the Torah. Israel needs to help his brother get restored. Do you agree? Now let's move on. This Torah portion and the next very verse that you find here looks at one of the most important introductions in the Bible, the introduction of this man. Anybody know who he is? Yosef. Yuf, Vav, Sab, Yosef. Okay. Genesis 37. 
verse 2. Notice how curiously they put these generations. These are the Toledor. El Toledor de Jacob. These are the generations of Jacob. And goes right to Joseph. Being 17 years old, was feeding in the flocks with his brethren, being still and lad, even with the sons of Bila and with the sons of Silpa, his father's wives. Joseph brought an evil report of them unto his father. So this is very curious. Instead of naming every son, he said, oh, this is the generation of Jacob, right into Joseph. Any detail in the Torah not worth looking? Absolutely. Every detail is important. We'll see here why. Let's look at Joseph's attributes. As you can see there, first and foremost, it says he was 17 years old. And a what? A roe, a shepherd. The term used here is he's becoming one shepherd, if you were to look into the Hebrew, because he's still what? 17. So that's the key. The key is... At 17, he's not quite there. At 17, it says he's a lad. He's somebody who is more a child than a man. Now, the sages describe the next term here where it says, with the sons of Bilai, with the sons of Silpa, as he was very friendly with them. What's the problem with these sons? These are the rest of the sons, because not all the other ones were born, not born to Rachel, right? So he took the time to go after these. They were kind of looked upon because they were sons of maidservants. So that's a quality that you see here. But not one well received by some of his other brothers. Their point, the sages also point out that between Yaakov and Yosef, there was a striking similarities. So, how many of you have a son? How many of you, your son looks exactly like you? Well, some of them do. They say, like father, like son? That's where it comes from. Some of them are very, very strikingly the same. And one of the things that they say is, that, well, Yosef was strikingly resemble the father. And that could be in many ways interpreted either with his physical or in his mannerism or how he conducted himself or anything like that. But he reminded them of the father, Yaakov. And they didn't like it. <laughs> they also hated that the brothers, and they wanted to kill them. Now let's deal with Joseph's report at the end of this verse. It says, Joseph brought an evil report of them unto their father. The sages say that this is an opportunity that Joseph took to bring Anything negative before his father about their brothers. How many of you have a kid like that? Well, how many of you were one of these kids? Better yet, you took the time to take to your parents about what your brother or your sister was doing, quote unquote, bad. You know some of those. We all have them, or unless we were one of those. Now, from their disdain that they've had towards the sons of Silpa and Bila, these brothers, every time that Yosef went on, it could be seen, is said, there he goes to gossip to our father and bring La Shonara to our father, and we get in trouble. Why? Because his father had a problem. And Yosef was looked upon differently. Do anybody of you have a Yosef in your house? 
Do you know that the first sin in the Bible is perpetuated by the actual serpent speaking evil against Hashem? Speaking. Here in Parashah, why I said maybe, maybe because of his youth. Maybe because he was encouraged by his father. Maybe there are other reasons why Yosef did this. And we'll take a look at some of these consequences, and they are grievous. But let's look at what the word has to say about this type of speech. In Leviticus 19, 17 and 18 states, Do not hate your brother in your heart, but rebuke your neighbor frankly, so that you won't carry sin because of him. Do not take vengeance on or bear a grudge against any of your people. Rather, love your neighbor as yourselves. And then he finished that statement and says, I am Adonai. Very important pasuk or verse. I love this one. Deuteronomy 27, 24. 24. Listen carefully. It says, A curse on anyone who secretly attacks a fellow member of the community should be those who speak evil. And then he finishes and said, all the people just say, amen. So the same concept also exists in the apostolic writing for those who like to see everything in the New Testament. In the book of Yaakov, book of James, chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, it says, brother, stop speaking against each other. Whoever speaks against a brother or judges a brother is speaking against the Torah and judging Torah. And if you judge Torah, you are not a doer of what the Torah says, but a judge. There is but one giver of Torah. He is also the judge with the power to deliver and to destroy. Who do you think you are judging your fellow human being? On the other hand, the scriptures gives us the guidelines behind the concepts of good judgment. In the book of Matthew chapter 7, we receive an instruction on how to carry on the important responsibility as believers of Messiah Yeshua who teaches us. Let's go there, Matthew 7, and let's read it. This is very important. Get it into your system. Matthew 7. I'm reading from the complete Jewish Bible. Verse 1, don't judge so that you won't be judged. For the way you judge others is how will you be judged. Did Yeshua say anything new? I just read it from the Torah. <laughs> they, they put sometimes this in a context, oh, what a revelation. No, it isn't. The measure which you measure out will be used to measure you. Why do you see the splinter in your brother's eye but not notice the log in your eye? How can you say, let me take the splinter out of your eye when you have the log in your eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your eye, then you will see clearly. And he goes on in verse 6. Don't give to dogs what is holy. And don't throw your pearls to the swine. If you do, they may trample them under their feet, then turn and attack you. And when he talks about not judging, it's judging in error without the Torah. Keep asking, and it will be given to you. Keep seeking, and you will keep knocking, and the door it will be opened unto you. For everyone who seeks, asks, receives, he who keeps seeking finds, and to him who keeps knocking, the door will be open. If there's anyone here, if his son's asking for a loaf of bread, will you give him a stone? Of course not. If he asks for a fish, will you give him a snake? So if you even, though you are bad, know how to give your children's gifts that are good, how much more? Your Father in heaven keep giving you good things to those who keep asking him. Verse 12, 
Always treat others as you would like them to treat you. That sums up the teachings of the Torah and the prophets. Some people take that, put it in their pockets, and that's all I need to learn. I don't need to learn the Torah. I don't need to learn the prophets. But it says here that as long as I treat you nice, it's okay. Wrong context. So he's speaking, and he knows who he's speaking to. They understand exactly. They need to apply the concepts that come and from the foundations. The foundations is the Torah. Going through the narrow gate, the gate that leads to destruction, is wide that the road broad and many travel, but it is the narrow gate and a hard road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So he's throwing some major zingers in there. Okay. And then we get to the very famous verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do what my Father in heaven wants on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we expel demons in your name? Didn't we perform many miracles in your name? Then I will tell them to their faces, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness, Torahless, whatever you want to inject in there, that's what it means. So now, Back to Yosef. The perspective behind Yosef is that he brought evil report to his father for anything their brothers did. Whether it was right or wrong, the measure in which he did, it was perceived by their brothers as bad. And they hated it for him. And this is what we're trying to bring. They hated it for him. Creating it created a rip between them, it created jealousy, all these other feelings between them. Okay, in Genesis 37 3 it says, We go from Yaakov in verse 2, immediately, verse 3 it says, Ve Israel. Anytime you see Yaakov versus Israel, there is a change. A change, the sages teach is a change. We're talking now a nation. We're talking now an elevation versus Yaakov, which keeps it to the nefesh on the ground. So we see here it says, Israel loved Joseph the best of all his sons, for he was the child of his old age, and he made him an ornamented tunic. Striped and colored tunic. Okay? He loved them and a child over the old age. Do you know the age difference between Yosef, Sebulon, and Issachar? The sages teach that uh, Issachar and Sebulon were probably within two years of Joseph. Was Yaakov old then? Absolutely. <laughs> So the expression here is, it's not only the child of his old age, it's his preferred son. He's looking at it because it was a son of his, what, beloved Rachel. And he looked at it, worked with it, and put him in front of his other sons differently. Gave him this special tunic, and now Houston, we have a problem. We have a problem. He worked 14 years for Rachel. Outside of Canaan with the famous Laban. Six more for all the cattle and everything he brought in. So Yaakov only has eye for Yosef. Yaakov only has eye for that beloved, and his brothers can see it. What we can learn from this, beloved, is we are called to love our kids unconditionally. Teach them the Torah. 
But we must be careful not to fall in a trap that might bring strife between them. Because Yosef could have been bringing exactly what he needed to bring before his father. But his father created the element also that created the strife between him and his brothers. And yes, he was a lad. But if there's plenty of examples in the Bible of other fathers who did not do their jobs with their sons. And it always brought trouble to the household. Now, would you like to look at the two messiahs here as we continue through the life of Joseph? I think you're going to like this. In this Torah portion, we have the appearance of, obviously, the preeminent in the next few Torah portions. This is the heritage of Yaakov who is actually going to save the nation. Okay? It says, I'm going to show you through each of these statements two messiahs. It says here, in Genesis 37, 11, his father waited for the matter. Because he told his father the dream. And he rebuked him, but he waited on the matter. You know, what do they have to point this out? He told his brothers, he told his father, Rashi is pleased, that this particular phrase here it says he waited it's more like he had a thought and he waited is it going to come true what it, my son just told me about this dream even the rabbi Lubavitch explains referring to this that Yaakov waiting meant that he was waiting for that Yosef was the Messiah Ben Yosef waiting for the revelation of Messiah bin David. From that, two messiahs. Perhaps, in Genesis Rabbah, regarding this, also this instance, we read, Yaakov, though, through that the resurrection of the dead will take place in his days, he thought. Why? Because he interpreted the dream that included Raquel, if you recall, who at that time was dead. If you recall, when he told his dream to his father, everybody was there, including his mother. He's talking about resurrection. Will only be the resurrection until Messiah ben, ben David comes. So you got a hidden clue there of Messiah Ben David. Next. Hineni. Answer Yosef when his father called him and said, I will go. And you see that 37 verse 13. So like his forefather, Yaakov answered the call of his father to go, and in this case, after his brothers. So Yosef went out, sent by his father. So did Messiah Yeshua answer Hineni and went forth his brothers at the request of the father in heaven. So he went, and he sent him to, from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem, verse 14. This is interesting because the first time you look at this, the valley of Hebron, how many people have been in Hebron? So you've been in Israel, you went to Mampelah, Mampelah, Hebron, is it a valley? No, it isn't, it's a, <laughs> it's a hill. Hebron is a hill, so this is kind of, uh, there's an allusion there, but I'm not going to get into it. It's, it's a hill, but look at what it says here. The association here is, from what city did David Hamelek rule from Judah? What city? Hebron. Okay. For seven years, he ruled from that. Obviously, Messiah Yeshua comes from the what? The house of Judah, for the line of David. So you have a connection there. And it says further there, and they came to Shechem. Well, Shechem is associated with Yosef. Why? 
Where did Joshua put the bones of ben, uh, Yosef? Shechem. So you have a connection here between the two messiahs. Same verse. Messiah ben Yosef. Messiah ben David. In the Targums, it says, hinting to these two messiahs. On the day that Yosef arose and went to Shechem. The Egyptians' exile really began. So you're starting here. Obviously, we know the dreams. We know what happens to Yosef in this Torah portion. We know he ends up going to what? Being sold and being sent to exile, which is what the Targum is referring to here when he looks at this. This is basically the beginning of that exile when he arose. Brings me to the next point. I'm looking for my brothers. Tell me where they are pastoring the flock. That is Yosef. When he encounters men on the field, he says, I'm looking for my brothers. What do you think about this one? The brothers lost. They're not where their father sent him. He can't find them. Other brothers lost. To him they are. So here's the illusion and the connection. He went to Shechem to find him, and they weren't there. They moved. Where did they go? If you read the scriptures. Okay. So if you read Matthew chapter 15, verse 24, it states that Messiah Yeshua was sent to do what? I'm going to read it for you. I was sent only to find the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What house are we talking about here? Yaakov's name is Israel. The brothers are lost. Who's looking for them? A Messiah. There's a similar passage in Luke 19.10 about the Messiah saving the lost. But there is more. When they saw him, they plotted against him. Chapter 37, verse 18. In the days of the Master Yeshua, many Jews rejected him. They didn't understand him. They didn't understand his mission. They were afraid. In other words, this was a problem. Just like that Yosef has a problem with his brothers. And the words found in the Gospel of Matthew Chapter 26, verse 3 and 4. You read it verbatim. And they plotted together to seize Yeshua and to kill him. They plotted against him. Messiah ben Joseph. Messiah ben David. Next one. This is very interesting. The term multicolor that was read in the Torah this morning is the term pasim. And the Midrash on this verse makes a contrast to a word that is very similar. The Hebrew word meaning lottery. And that word is pais. Pasim, pais. So the Midrash explains that the brothers casted lots for his coat after selling Yosef to the Midianites. Well, what's the connection? John chapter 19, verse 24 states, The soldiers casting lots for Yeshua's garments. Wow. Want to see some more? And they took him and threw him in the pit. What is the connection? Pit, it's a picture of the grave. The passage goes on to say that the pit was empty and without water, wasn't it? In the gospel, the account of the tomb of Yosef of Joseph of Arimathea, amazingly, even this man's name is correlating, pointing out Messiah ben Yosef, 
And Arimathea from the root word meaning height. I looked and saw in the name of Hashem. We'll add Yasav and we'll bring something higher. Okay? Which is from that word, root word for Arimathea, or the word room in Hebrew, Messiah King David. So, we have the pit, we have the tomb, the tomb is empty, we had Yosef, Yosef, who is a picture of obviously the Yosef, the uh, son of Yaakov, now opening this pit so the Messiah Yeshua can go in the pit. You see the connection? But what happens right after that? What happened after Messiah Yeshua was put in the pit? What feast? Pesach. Say, it needed to go in before the Sabbath. Of what? Pesach. What do you have in Pesach? A Seder. <laughs> this is a Seder. After Mashiach was buried, Israel had the Passover meal. After Yosef was sent to the pit, they had a meal. His brothers had a meal. Want another one? A caravan of Ishmaelites with camels bearing myrrh. Verse 25. Myrrh and aloes were the spices that Yeshua's body was prepared with by Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea before the women can come in and pour more spices and perfumes. And here you have him, the connection. Next. And behold, Yosef was not in the pit. Should be one of your favorites. Reuben returned to the pit, and the pit was what? Empty. What is that? Resurrection. It's similar to the passage found in John chapter 20, verse 3 and 4, in which Peter and John looked into an empty tomb. Yeshua had resurrected, and everybody should say, Hallelujah, Yeshua had resurrected. But Yosef, who was sold by his brothers, was then sent into exile to Egypt. So does Yeshua. Yeshua has been separated from his people. Yeshua has been separated from his people for more than 2,000 years. In the hands of who? Of the nations. So still today, in exile. So now, do you want one more? <laughs> so they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. Genesis 37, 31. We have here a direct connection to what? The young kipper. Sacrifice of a single goat for a sin offering for the nation. Leviticus 16. In order to appear like Joseph was dead, his brothers dip his clothes in the blood. And here's the connection. In your favorite book, the book of Hiskalus. Everybody know what that is? Revelation 19, 9 through 16. So let's stand while I read this so we can close. Pay it attention to these words and what I just read here. Yom Kippur. There's going to be one Yom Kippur. And this is an image of it. It says here, And the angel said to me, Write, How blessed are those who have been invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Then he added, These are God's very words. I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said, don't do that. I'm only a fellow servant with you and your brother who have the testimony of Yeshua. Worship God. For the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. 
Next, I saw heaven open, and there before me was a white horse sitting on it was the one called Faithful and True. And it is in righteousness that he passes judgment and goes to battle. His eyes were like fiery flame, and on his head were many royal crowns. And he had a name written which no one knew but himself. Hold it. Everybody knows their name. But it says no one knew by himself. So he's going to reveal his name. And this goes lined up with what the rabbis teach you. He's going to reveal his name to his people. He said he was wearing a robe that had been soaked in blood. Unbelievable. And the name by which he is called the word of God, the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with a staff of iron. It is he who treads the winepress from which flows the wine of the fierce rage of Adonai, gods of heaven's army. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has his name written. King of kings, Lord of lords, hallelujah. To all and to all your families, tomorrow we begin the Feast of Dedication. Now, that's the English of the word Hanukkah. So if anybody tells you otherwise, you say, no, no. It's a feast of dedication because that's a translation, Hanukkah, into English. For those who know Spanish, we are going to be having a shiur or a teaching on Facebook, Yeshiva Shu Español, on Wednesday night. And that's going to speak a little bit about an introduction of a program that we call in Spanish, Sabi Usted, which in English translates and doesn't have this catchy of phrase, but it means, do you know? And, and what it means is basically it's a basic on foundations of Messianic Judaism. And we're going to be discussing there just an introduction and Hanukkah. So if you want to tune in then, you're more than welcome. But I hope you and your family have a very, very happy Hanukkah season. It is a season of miracles known in the Bible. It's also known as the Festival of Lights. We see here the festival of lights correlating to the darkest month of the year, but the light of Yeshua is in the midst of it. So many things. Encourage your children. Read the book of uh, First and Second Maccabees. Read the prophets. Read and know that it is about dedicating the temple back to Hashem and winning over the enemy. That's what Hanukkah is all about. Amen? All right. So let's pray. Oh, yeah. Visit each other during the season, uh, during the week. Obviously, we're not here Sunday night. We're going to only be here uh, Saturday night, um, which will be Sunday, Yom Rishon. Different congregations have different nosa. We, 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 we share a lot with the other congregations. Some people meet throughout the week. Some people try to meet the first and the last day. We got people coming from great distances as well. But we like to make at least one time, especially because there's always one Shabbat in eight days, that we can really, really hone in in bringing everybody together and spending the time together for Hanukkah. The children, it's important that we impart this into the children. The children need to get this ingrained. They have a lot of things, especially with this season lining up where we're lining up this week. There's a lot of competition out there. So you, got, you, you have to get them honed in and, and tell them, hey, listen, this is in the Bible. Okay? But if you don't teach them the Bible, they don't know. They say, teach them. Read in the Bible, tell them about dedication. Every time you find the word dedication in the Bible, which talks about the Mishkan, the tabernacle in the wilderness, when it was dedicated, the word here is Hanukkah. Okay? Every time you see that, there's that connection to this particular observation. Amen? So don't forget.